The following edition of Connecticut Valley Views is made possible by Windsor Federal Savings with offices in Windsor, Bloomfield, Granby, and East Windsor. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936. Join me, Susan Regan, host of Connecticut Valley Views, the most widely watched interview program on Connecticut Public Access TV. Proof to the people is the byline, insight without bias, generating a 360 perspective. Our mission is to focus on topical subjects with thought-provoking interviews regarding municipal leadership, current affairs, educational and political topics, as well as key destination points in New England. And here's your host for Connecticut Valley Views, Susan Regan. Hello. And thank you for joining me today. We are at the offices of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence in Wethersfield, Connecticut. And my guest is Karen Jarmock, and she is the Chief Executive Office for, Officer for CCADV. It's a pleasure to be here with you, thank Karen. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. Um, what we're going to be discussing, basically, is there is a report that you have done that is improving outcomes for children and youth exposed to family work, uh, family violence correct. workshop, the findings and recommendations, and this was done in January 2015, is that correct? That is correct, we issued the report in January. Okay, all right, now I'm gonna read something, a little bit of background on it where we're focusing at the moment. In households with domestic violence, 50% are households with children, most are children under the age of five, and most have multiple incidents. In terms of families involved with child protective services, 75% of those families have domestic violence occurring in the home. Fill us in on some of the other details of who is involved and what is involved in these violent aspects. Sure, so the impetus for the um, report actually was what occurred last spring and early summer in our state of Connecticut. So here at Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we study domestic violence homicide or near deaths as well, among other things. And uh, there was a circumstance in June, July, May, June, and July last year uh, where women were murdered uh, in their home by their spouse or boyfriend, and children were present at the scene of every single one of those homicides. Uh, young children under the age of five, about six in total. And so from my perspective as the leader of this organization, there was more work that we could be doing to focus on what are we doing systemically as a state. Uh, to impact uh, children who are exposed to family violence in terms of improving their outcomes. Mm -hmm. Just in Connecticut in general, we know that there are 1,200 children who stay in our shelters annually. And also in our state, there are 40,000 family violence arrests a year. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous number. And in a number of those circumstances, children are in the home. So what are we doing, whether it's law enforcement, uh, whether it's the medical community within emergency rooms, behavioral health organizations and our domestic violence agencies to work more collaboratively uh, to improve outcomes for kids exposed to family violence. Well, I would think that most likely part of it is obviously to protect the children, but this is a systemic thing because if they are exposed to it, mm -hmm. that broadens the scope of them potentially becoming people who create violence later on. So you're not only taking care of the current issue, hopefully preventative issues going forward. You're absolutely correct. I mean, mm. domestic violence is a learned behavior, right? So um, it's about power and control, but children, we know when they view domestic violence uh, growing up, they um, age with an understanding that this is uh, an appropriate behavior. And so there's a lot of work that we do from a prevention standpoint. Or at least acceptable. Acceptable. <laughs> um, acceptable, mm. appropriate, yes. this is how we treat each other. Right. So their view of a healthy relationship is clearly skewed. And so um, if we can um, intervene at a young age, whether that's through prevention measures, um, there's a lot of work around coaching boys to men. Mm -hmm. How do we reach young boys at a particular age? We're partnering with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Connecticut on some initiatives. Um, but how do we work to address this issue before it creates and exasperates itself into their adulthood? Well, you've been here four years now, is that four correct? Four years, yeah. Four years. Have you seen this particular, particular area of issue with young children? Have, do you feel it's expanded, or do you think you've been able to put a lid on it to some degree? So from my viewpoint, it's an, an issue where we're not always focusing our efforts, and that's why I approached the Office of the Child Advocate last summer about doing a report, um, taking a look at um, how our systems, and we, you know, we brought in state agency folks, law enforcement, 
um, a lot of our child advocates to talk about how are we working as systems because sometimes there's ways, circumstances where we're on parallel paths but not necessarily collaborating. And so there really is this opportunity to do more. And, and what I would say is there is a, a bill before the legislature right now which would, would create a legislative task force starting this summer to take a look at how to improve outcomes to children exposed to family violence. And I think that's going to be the impetus around better policy and practice and communication on this issue. Mm -hmm. Now, the results of these things, they have a long-term prognosis if these things go uh, unchecked, right? I mean, the homicides, um, the eventual outcome of what the children may do themselves. I mean, what other ill effects happen with so these children? there are serious impacts of children being exposed to family violence. And I think mm -hmm. you and I were talking earlier about, mm -hmm. you know, domestic violence is about the physical violence, but it's absolutely and equally about the emotional abuse, uh, the psychological abuse, financial abuse, harassment, stalking. And so all of those things are part of domestic violence. And so um, what can we do again to help children? Um, exposed to this and we know that children who are exposed to this they struggle with depression mm -hmm. um, they have issues in school um, and into their adulthood uh, in terms of how they view a healthy relationship so if we can have stronger measures in place on the on, on the early side it will hopefully prevent better outcomes on the latter side now in this report you were taking a look and comparing it to other states that have more stringent laws is that correct i mean is that is that what you're holding up to the light connecticut could improve to say meet another states what they have for punishment sure so there are opportunities for mm -hmm. better laws and in particular mm -hmm. the law that we were considering and trying to work toward mm -hmm. this legislative session has to do with when there's a conviction on a family violence charge and children are present, there should be a stronger penalty um, associated with mm -hmm. that conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still working towards So that it's penalty. not only the mother that was shot or whatever the Correct. occurrence was. If it occurred with a child present, present. Um, or witnessed to, mm -hmm. uh, therefore there would be a stronger penalty upon conviction. Uh, and But there's also, so from my perspective, it's about laws, right? Yes. But then it's just about better policy. You know, how are systems such as the Department of Children and Families, Department of Emergency Services and Public Safety, um, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, how are these systems and our localized, we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. domestic violence mm -hmm. agencies where there are 18 in our state, how are we all working in alignment to better serve these kids? Mm -hmm. Because we know the numbers are enormous. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, Karen, what I want to ask you, in your, your previous career background, you were a Democratic state's representative from Enfield. Mm -hmm. You ran an aggressive uh, run for state in 2012. You, would, you, would already, you were here, and Correct. you took over from Erica Tyndall, right, Correct. the yep. previous person. And then you were invited to replace Ms. Tyndall, right? I it was. was an interim position to I begin was, with? I was approached to come here as a, the interim executive director. And honestly, I think at the onset, I really didn't have an intention to stay mm -hmm. longer and the uh, agency was just looking for an interim, but it really was a very good fit for both of us. And so here I am four years later, and I feel really lucky to get up every morning and be able to do this work. Now, how many people in your organization, how many people actually work so for you directly might, and out, outside these offices? Sure, so people might be surprised to know there's only 11 of us here, mm -hmm. and we're a statewide nonprofit, um, and we oversee, um, we're a state coalition. In every state in our country, mm -hmm. there's a state coalition against mm -hmm. domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so we manage a number of state and federal contracts. We uh, do fundraising. Um, to Like uh, what kind of fundraising things do you do? We have an annual event called Our First 100 Men, and that's in November. We honor uh, over um, 100 men a year mm -hmm. um, who are uh, making a difference around being mentors and leaders on this issue okay. of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're very fortunate to raise money, and we do a lot of public awareness with the funds that we raise because we aren't funded to do public awareness. Mm -hmm. And then we have been having an annual reception at the governor's residence. We're slated to do that June 23rd. And uh, that helps us to raise money too. All right, so you get your funding from there. And then where else would you get? Federal and state funding? Federal contracts know. and state contracts. And, um, and again, we, we do some grants, some private and foundation grants. Mm -hmm. And so our services here, or things that we oversee in the state range from family violence victim advocates and courts, uh, to law enforcement. We, we have a director of law enforcement services that works on training and we have a lethality assessment program. We're very proud here in the state of Connecticut. We brought it three years ago to our state where p police are doing an intervention at the scene of a domestic violence incident uh, to help the victim and link them to services. 
Um, we have a cultural accessibility and diversity program. We want to make sure that we're reaching those so-called underserved populations. Mm -hmm. Last year, we were successful in obtaining funding through the state for a statewide Spanish hotline for the very first time. Excellent. Good. Uh, which has been very, very meaningful um, and a very busy hotline. And so those are some of the things that we do. We oversee, um, obviously, hotlines and shelters and uh, victim advocacy in court. Mm -hmm. We provide a lot of training and technical assistance uh, here at our state organization. Mm -hmm. We train um, literally hundreds of people a year, advocates. There's 300 across the state of Connecticut working within programs. They are all certified as domestic violence advocates, which is enormously important. There are statewide standards so that you know that when you are a victim and you are calling for help and you're going to a program, they are held to a very high set of standards. So it's across the board, it's a level playing field Absolutely. for everyone, yes. for everyone. All right, so you have 11 people here and within that capacity, what are those job positions involved with? Sure. Administrative so you, to some degree. Yeah, I mean, we have a director of policy and communications. That mm -hmm. person assists me with um, a lot of the legislative work on both the state and federal level. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we do communications as in public awareness, newsletters, uh, to inform people about access to help and services. Uh, we have someone who works with, uh, uh, it's called offender risk reduction. Mm -hmm. So when offender is being released from the correctional system, how do we help the victim? How do we help them prepare for that release and make sure that they're safe? Mm -hmm. Again, we have someone who oversees all sorts of victim advocacy, both in the family court and the criminal court. Um, those are folks who are trying to apply for restraining orders. Um, there's over 55 advocates in courts who are working on a daily basis on restraining orders, protective orders when there's been an arrest. Um, we have our cultural um, accessibility and diversity program, again, trying to reach those underserved uh, populations uh, to make sure that we're serving them in a way that is culturally relevant for them. Our law enforcement uh, initiative uh, that works to train law enforcement officers um, and uh, create the lethality mm -hmm. assessment program. So I would think then you have someone here who's multilingual, then, or we at do. least is Spanish. Yeah. And that something. multilingual uh, director of that project actually does trainings in Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we work very collaboratively with the Hispanic Health Council um, to make sure that we are serving that population of victims appropriately. Well, you've got a you've got a lot to oversee here. It's it's it, break down for me what would be the majority of the time that's spent on what aspect the most. I mean, in other words, this particular report focused around the children. But if you were to break this down, say, on an annual basis, is this the types of things that you address? Give me a sort of a percentage of it's mostly these types of issues versus those types of issues. Sure. And, uh, and, and let's even talk about, are we talking about Caucasian, uh, race related? I mean, are there some, some percentages to give us a picture? Sure. So um, in terms of how we're serving people, it's, it's honestly, we are pressed in all areas, right? So Connecticut's domestic violence shelters mm -hmm. are functioning at um, over capacity all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And that's been an enormous issue for us for about two years now. Over capacity all the time. We just did a statewide needs assessment and um, uh, we found that victims are staying in shelter mm -hmm. much longer. And they're staying longer because there's not always those transitional housing uh, opportunities. I see. Okay, the ha so, halfway house, if you will. Yeah, like not, 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 not like a halfway house, but a, a, yeah. like a, an affordable housing option right, for right. that victim to transition right. to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been an enormous issue. Uh, in terms of pressing, pressing problems, I mean, when you look at 40,000 arrests in the state on family violence mm -hmm. charges, that is very notable. Um, in terms of our cultural accessibility, that's an enormous project. But keep in mind, domestic violence crosses all sectors of our society. It's right. a problem where there's no economic or ethnic boundaries to it, right? So is, it, is it driven by, is it actually the guns? Is it drugs? Is it uh, uh, more education is needed? What do you, what do you think is pushing this? It goes this? back to prevention. It's, 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 it's a learned behavior, right? And so as you can imagine. So we're becoming more uncivilized as a community well, as it were? I don't know that it's more. I think mm. it's a sustained um, socioeconomic issue, right? So it's mm -hmm. a sustained behavior. Um, when you look at the structure of funding and um, how we're um, supported to do the work mm -hmm. that we do, there's very little for prevention. Actually, we receive no money for prevention. Uh, we do. And what do you consider prevention? Prevention what? is that we have a statewide prevention plan, for example. So we were not funded to do a statewide prevention right. plan, but I looked at my staff and said, we have to eke out the time 
and the energy and bring together the appropriate stakeholders to, holders to the table because we have to start to address this from a prevention measure. Right, right. right. Um, those when we were talking about the boys, coaching boys to men. Yes. Men as mentors. Um, getting to boys at a young age, especially statistically, we find that boys who witness domestic violence at a young age will grow into their adulthood believing this is an okay behavior. Mm -hmm. So um, prevention is trying to reach this issue before it exasperates into the issue that it is today. I, I will not say that we're seeing, we're seeing more complex problems um, and a very consistent demand for service. Mm -hmm. If you were to give me, let, let's say, uh, let's just take an incident. Let's say that a woman is shot in the home, two young children, uh, somewhere between four and six, are involved. Um, where do you step in? Obviously, the police show up, someone is arrested, and so forth. What is the next step that would happen? What would your department be doing? So we do a number of things. We have the Connecticut Domestic Violence Fatality Review Committee. That uh, group takes a look at, they meet monthly, and they take a look at domestic violence homicide. We mm -hmm. always want to understand where were those opportunities to have changed what happened, mm -hmm. right? How can we do better? And that drives a lot of our policy. Now, in terms of law enforcement, our other role is um, to work with law enforcement. How can they be part of that child's nar uh, mm. trauma narrative, right? Because how well or well not that, that law enforcement officer um, assists the mm -hmm. child at the scene of an incident is how well or well not that child heals uh, from this. Um, we might wor be working with the family. Sometimes we are not working with the family. I think what's incredibly frustrating for us is we know from our statistics that in the case of domestic violence homicide in Connecticut, in the majority of circumstances, victims and their family members or coworkers did not know where to turn for help. Mm. And that's why that statewide mm. hotline number and the public awareness that we do is just so critical. Well, someone would ask, you know, you'd say if there's violence in the home, why is the wife or the mother or the girlfriend, whatever the situation is. Why is she not saying something to someone? If she, you know, because when you've got young children around you, and I understand it's the fear of, of what will happen if I tell someone. And of course, there's always in the controlling circumstance, they try and keep you away from your family, they keep you isolation. away from your friends and yeah. the isolation and so forth. But still, when you have children, that should be the impetus to say, I've got to go see somebody. Are you able to? to train the young women to say the, the, the slightest provocation where you think there could be? So you raise a really good issue because, mm. and I think um, in particular around the incident that happened over the summer with Ray Rice and mm. the NFL, yes. um, it created a real national dialogue mm -hmm. around why do women stay, right? Mm -hmm. You know, why do women stay? What is she, why is she putting up with this, mm. you know? Um, she has children, why, you know, doesn't mm. she care about his children, her children? Uh, I mean, domestic violence is a very complex problem and sometimes it is a process of um, someone leaving that relationship. We know that when someone leaves that type of relationship it can be the most dangerous time. Mm -hmm. And so what we really work on with victims is what we call safety planning and that looks differently for each person mm -hmm. but how given that he or she may want to leave that relationship, how can they stay safe? You know, victims stay for various reasons. Mm. We're a victim-centered organization. It's not mm. our role to pass a judgment, but to try to work with them where they're at and to try to ensure that they're safe, that their children are safe, and how do we help them move away from this violent relationship. And I also think it's a, it's a psychological thing, too, because there is a, an, an element of what you know. Uh, the situation you know may be better than the situation you'll be putting yourself in. Is it, is it more dangerous <coughs> to leave? I know that sounds odd to some people, but... Mm -hmm. But I'm out there it, by it, myself. It, I don't have a job. Mine, is it more dangerous <coughs> if I leave? If I leave, uh, will, will he kill me? If mm. I leave, will he hurt my family? If mm -hmm. I leave, you know, will, you know, uh, mm. I don't speak English mm. and he's saying that he'll get the kids and I won't. And I don't understand just, the laws and yes, I don't understand how I mean, they there's work. There's just all sorts of reasons. It's very, I understand that people struggle with why does that person stay, but it's very complex and our role is to try to reach individuals to let them know that there is a path. Um, to I was going to say, I was going to say, because you're, you're, you're educating them. So now that this incident has happened, you're going to tell them what their rights are, what they have the ability to yeah, do, so who can help them. When there's <coughs> an arrest, and we, what we mm -hmm. were saying earlier, there's 40,000 a year. So we have a victim advocate in, in uh, each court, and mm -hmm. that person meets with the victim um, on the morning of mm -hmm. the arraignment. It's always the arraignment mm -hmm. the next morning to talk about safety planning and to, to serve as a resource and to try to get them some help. 
um, knowing that maybe that person takes that information, goes back to the situation, but maybe a few months later, they do reach out for help. Yes. Sometimes it's, a, that, it's that process. All right, well, so at least you can see some headway Absolutely. being made. All right, now, <clears throat> according to the U.S. Attorney General's National Task Force on Children Exposed to Violence, exposure to violence in any form harms children, and different forms of violence have different negative effects, as health and mental health and so forth, as you said, school and peer relationships. But if you were to pick, again, we're going back to percentages, would you say there, there's more physical uh, harm done or more emotional? Would you, what, I mean, what, what, from what you've seen in the past four years? That's or a, a combination question. of yeah, both? Yeah, I really think it's a combination. I, we, I can't, because quite often they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, there are times and circumstances where it's primarily the psychological <clears throat> and emotional abuse, and it only yields itself mm. physically or in homicide at the very end, mm. um, or all along it's physical. So it's definitely a combination, and all are very, very significant and impactful to the victim and or to the children. Because the children could be physically harmed and psychologically you'll see the issue later on. Or they could be psychologically harmed and later on cause physical harm to someone else. It, that, I mean, could, that, that could yeah, be I a mean, scenario. That is know. correct. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> When you, how many cases do you actually see? Say average a month or um, during the well, year? And on average, sixty thousand a year. So with the eight, eighteen domestic violence agencies, they mm. are serving sixty thousand victims a year. So that's again um, mm -hmm. uh, about a thousand living in shelters, adults, uh, twelve hundred children a year. Obviously, extensive work out in communities to help victims. Not everyone is needing shelter. Mm. They might be needing that support or counseling or hotline or advocacy in court. Um, but that is the, the, the general average. You know, we know that there are 9,000 restraining order applications mm. a year. That's a huge, huge number mm. of people looking for protection. And a lot of times they break those laws. I mean, they're told they have a restraining order and they're still within whatever it is. 100 feet of the house or and whatever. that's so dangerous because mm. we know statistically from Dr. Jackie Campbell out of John Hopkins who studies domestic violence homicide mm. that if an offender is willing to violate the restraining or protective order, they are willing to commit homicide. Mm. It's kind of, they, they've lost everything and there's nothing else to lose. They're, they have no regard, mm. right, for sort of the boundaries or the law. Okay. All right. Um, now, what, it's, I think what it's important to point out too is that it, it's not just this physical violence but it's this psycholo psychological aggression that's being instilled in the children because as you said they see it they see it perhaps a male on a female and it, it's a an intense thing that contributes to the culture of violence in the home and ma maintains this dysfunction so what I'm trying to get at here is within their own family they see it and perhaps surrounded by other people, uh, other families that are having this issue. Do the children still take, even when removed from the situation, do they still take those things with them even when put in a safety net? Do you see a child that goes on having the problems despite well, removal? You know, I think that... Does um, it become systemic? It is a systemic issue. I think that clearly when we see adult victims um, often, not mm. all the time, but often there is a backstory, right, mm -hmm. to their childhood and mm. how they grew up and what they experienced as a child. And there was violence in their home. Mm. So um, there is a long term impact um, on adults um, for into, you know, their adulthood uh, when children are exposed. To family violence. I mean, yeah. we know that. That's a, that's a and I think national the other thing, statistic. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, is that we, even if you're not exposed to it anymore, there's so much violence on TV on the internet um, and in the news that even though you've re actually removed the child from it, they're s still seeing it. It's still visual impact. It still reminds them of the situation. So those kinds of things you can't screen out entirely. Yeah, you know, we are working on a really interesting project where our state coalition is partnering with Connecticut Children's Medical Center, mm -hmm. and we're s establishing a center of excellence for children exposed to family violence and it, how we might improve those Where will outcomes. that be located? What, oh. uh, at Connecticut Children's, oh, oh, the oh, okay. Office of Child and Community Health. It might be the first in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of hospitals that house uh, children exposed to the broader problem of violence. Mm -hmm. But given uh, what we know here in the state of Connecticut, we felt that it was uh, immensely uh, important to be able to offer this around um, family violence specifically. So this would be to improve outcomes for children 
in our state and nationally. Well, that would be a crowning us. achievement. I mean, given right now We're you... are excited about it. It's, yeah. it's really necessary. It's a leadership role, really, for the state. Correct. Considering yes. right now you feel as though we're behind other states in achieving what we should. I don't know that we're behind other mm -hmm. states. I mean, we don't have some as far of the as the punishment. That do. Right. That, that, that's right. one particular law. Right. But I think there's a lot of things that Connecticut does well. I mean, clearly we have this very strong partnership with Connecticut Children's and Hartford Hospital, mm -hmm. and working very diligently to improve outcomes for kids. There's a child advocate within each of the 18 domestic violence agencies. Um, they are trauma informed and trained extensively on how to work with kids. So. I think there's a lot of things that we're doing well, but you always want to seek opportunities to do better. All right, when you're dealing with a child that, let's say, is not, you have not heard anything from the home, you have not seen anything, the child doesn't have any bruises itself and so forth, how do you identify this non-violent, non-physical thing? Is it the, is it outbursts in the school? Is that, is that what you're, are those are the well, red flags that so you just see? So we're not, so, the, so we are the state organization right. on domestic violence. So we are often seeing victims. We mm -hmm. see adult victims. Mm -hmm. um, and very often they have children. Mm -hmm. And so that's when children are coming to us. So it wouldn't uh, okay. be so much. So it's that, at that point. Okay. Yeah, it's at that point, why, whether it's in shelter or community or the scene of a family violence. So the initial thing would be the adult situation Correct. that leads to this, exactly. leads to this other thing. Exactly. All right, so what will be now the next steps, Karen, for now that you've got this report, you've got the recommendations, what will be the next steps? I mean, uh, I assume legislation? Yeah, so we're looking to have the uh, in legislation pass this session, and it's been very well received by the Children's Committee, mm -hmm. and it's moving forward this task force mm -hmm. uh, to improve outcomes for children exposed mm -hmm. to family violence. Um, hopefully by late summer, early fall will be the initial beginnings of the Center of Excellence uh, with Connecticut Children's and CCADV. Uh, and then we're always, um, you know, ensuring that our child advocates who are on the ground 24-7 mm -hmm. working with kids and families exposed to domestic violence or experiencing this, that they are um, meeting high standards um, and they are trauma-informed. Um, and that is um, one of the best interventions that we can offer. Well, I, I think you've done a great job in the past four years, and I congratulate you yeah. on that. And I think that you seem to have, you, you seem to be able to, uh, observe, take in, and wrap your arms around what the problems are. And then it's the management of the funding, obviously, the legislation that you're putting in place, uh, working with the other agencies that you've been able to do that. So I do want to congratulate you on it. And for our viewers, what we'd like to do is to give some information here that uh, would be valuable to them. They're going to their website, of course. That would be www.ctcadv.org. There's also a state hotline, which is 1-888-774-2900. And uh, Karen has also said you can email her at kjarmock, that's J-A-R-M-O-C, at ctcadv.org. So I think hopefully people will be able to take advantage of it if you know anyone who needs help, um, if you are in need of assistance yourself, and certainly don't hesitate to do so. So I thank you. I thank appreciate, you appreciate thank your time. You. And I want to thank you for joining me today. And please see us on Facebook. And you can see all of our programs on our website at ctvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan. Thank you for joining me and bringing proof to the people. Our thanks to Windsor Federal Savings for making this program possible. Neighbors helping neighbors since 1936.